for the third installment of Telling Tales, the mythic imagination of Tolkien and Lewis. Uh, this evening I'm going to tell you two stories. Uh, one of them, I, I, you know, if you've read the Chronicles of Narnia, you'll be very familiar with. It's just a snippet of, uh, uh, from the book, The Voyage of the Dawn Treader, but uh, a really moving, uh, powerful part of that story. Uh, the other story, I, I dare say few are familiar with, it comes from Tolkien, and uh, um, I think it's perhaps one of the best love stories that's ever been written. What, what will tie both of these stories together uh, is that they're both redemptive stories. Um, and so, you know, we've looked at the song of creation. Uh, we've looked at last week the battle of good and evil where I stole most of my thunder for what I thought I was going to be talking about tonight, uh, which has borne unexpected good fruit, which is I had to go deeper into Tolkien lore in order to pull out a story that uh, could be a, a story of redemption. And so I'm, I'm really looking forward to telling you that story. Um, okay, a little... Uh, some of my reasoning for telling these particular, uh, these two particular stories. Um, it's that there are two, uh, I think, particularly uh, disturbing, uh, cynical assumptions that are just woven into the fabric of our public discourse. I mean, you, you hear in some way or another these two assumptions all the time. Uh, the first is that Everything anybody wants to say, uh, any claim anybody wants to make, uh, you know, for morality or this or that is essentially a power play. People say what they're saying because they're looking to get more power. You, you see this all the time. Uh, so, for instance, if you make claims for, if Christians, for instance, make claims for Christian morality, uh, it, that often invites the objection that, well, what you're, you're, talking about morality because it's a way that you can gain power over people who don't uh, fit into your moral categories. Uh, and so that's just a power play. But it's basically the assumption that anybody who's making any sort of political argument, any moral claims, uh, what they're doing is they're trying to get the upper hand in some kind of power grab that everybody's doing. Um, and, and Okay, fine. Like, is that, does that happen in our world? Are there sort of discourses and claims that people make uh, because what they're trying to do is get more power? Well, obviously. But does that mean that everything boils down to a power play and that any claim that anybody wants to make is because they want the upper hand in some sort of struggle uh, for you know, a greater measure of authority and power uh, within our you know, political realm? Well. I certainly hope not, because that's an extraordinarily cynical thing, because what, what that ends up bracketing out of human life is a genuinely uh, sacrificial gift. That becomes absolutely impossible if everything is a power grab. Uh, but there's a kind of worry that that's, that's what's underlying every claim that anybody wants to make over against uh, somebody else. Um, uh, the second, uh, I think, pretty cynical assumption uh, is some version of people can't change. Uh, and here's where you see this. Uh, how many times have we seen uh, uh, a politician, a public, not even a politician, you know, could be a, a movie star or any kind of public figure uh, that uh, loses their position uh, because somebody went way back in social media and found some record of something that they said that could be construed as racist or something that they did that there's no possible recovery from. Uh, this is happening all the time. And the, there's a kind of hidden assumption there that however far back in the past we had to go to find this you know, picture of you doing something that you shouldn't have done or this record of you saying something that was uh, rather irresponsible, um, that you cannot recover from that. What you need to do is just sort of do enough breast beating that maybe, maybe you could weather it, but that's not really uh, quite clear that you can do that. Uh, the hidden assumption there is that really people don't change. You said that in the past, you did that in the past, and you are now a prisoner uh, of your past, and we are not going to let you forget it. Uh, and this happens uh, sort of on every end of the political spectrum. Uh, I mean, the, the rejoicing, the schadenfreude that happens when we dig up something really juicy from your past uh, is very real because we know, you know, people don't change. That's who you were 10 years ago. That's what you said 10 years ago. That's who you are today. 
People don't change. So we have two sort of very cynical assumptions uh, that everything's a power play uh, and that people don't really change. And so you can be perpetually a prisoner of your past. Uh, what that, uh, what these two assumptions do is they form a really, really significant obstacle to the gospel. Because the gospel is a story of redemption. And redemption always requires some sort of sacrificial gift. And if we don't believe that that's possible because everybody's after power, well then, can we really tell a truly redemptive story such as the story of the gospel? Uh, furthermore, if people don't change, I mean, that is the story of redemption. That you have someone, you know, I once was blind. I once was blind, but now I see. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Uh, you know, the, a character arc that uh, moves beyond kind of the initial flaws uh, and uh, is truly redeemed through some sort of transformation. I mean, that's just the stuff of good stories. And if people don't change, can we really tell a story of redemption? Seems to be. Uh, by the very fact of the assumptions that a lot of people, they hold implicitly um, and simply uh, assume without a great deal of scrutiny uh, are intrinsic obstacles to the telling of a redemptive story. So rather than just rail against this, uh, which is not going to do you any good, is not going to do me any good, uh, and it's not going to do people out there any good. Uh, I'm going to tell two redemptive stories that uh, speak into, you know, kind of slantwise uh, these, these two assumptions. And again, what is, I think Emily Dickinson had it right. Sometimes we've got to tell the truth, but we've got to tell it slant. And here's the power of the story is it tells, it, it tells uh, the truth uh, slantwise uh, in a way that... Uh, you know, though we have these kind of conscious obstacles to hearing the truth, uh, a story kind of comes in here with a kind of power that rational discourse just doesn't have. Um, I mean, that's why Hamlet, when he wants to, you know, catch the king uh, uh, and reveal his guilty conscience, what he doesn't do is he, he doesn't confront the king and with, directly with uh, his crime of killing his brother and assuming the throne and marrying his wife. Uh, rather, he, he concocts this play uh, that has very similar circumstances so that the truth can come in slantwise. Um, so two stories today. First, uh, comes from Tolkien's The Silmarillion. Um, this is a picture of uh, the uh, gravestone of uh, J.R.R. Tolkien and his wife, Edith Mary Tolkien. Uh, and you'll see two names here, Luthien and Baron. Um, uh, this, was a, this is because the story of Baron and Luthien, uh, which is, I think, possibly Tolkien's deepest and most profound of all the stories he's ever told. Uh, was a, it was a deeply personal thing for him because what he uh, did in this story is he captured something of the love uh, that he and his wife enjoyed. Uh, and one of the, my favorite things about what uh, C.S. Lewis said about his friend Tolkien is that he was the most married man I've ever met. Uh, so the story of uh, Baron and Luthien. Uh, just a couple of things that you need to know. Um, yes, uh, Luthien uh, is riding a, a, a dog. This is the hound of the gods, uh, Huan. Uh, Luthien... Uh, was uh, an elf, and part of the, uh, the nature of an elf is that they are gifted by the creator with immortality. Uh, Baron, on the other hand, is a man, uh, and uh, though he has an exceptionally long life uh, compared to you know, the typical human lifespan that we all enjoy and suffer from, uh, he, he was a mortal man doomed to die. Okay, the story of Baron and Luthien. Uh, in the Silmarillion, uh, Tolkien tells this story about how in the first age of Middle Earth, Baron, the mortal man, falls in love with Luthien, the most beautiful of all the children of uh, Iluvatar, the creator. Uh, she is the immortal daughter of Thingol, who is the elf king of uh, the faraway land of Doriath. Uh, one day, uh, Baron uh, sees off in the distance, in the woods, Luthien dancing. And he falls madly in love with her and thus begins his quest. 
Uh, he makes a long journey uh, all the way to the land of Doriath, far away, uh, to ask for the hand of Luthien uh, by having a conversation with Thingol, her father. Uh, Thingol is none too pleased uh, with this request that a mortal man doomed to die uh, wants uh, to marry uh, his uh, beloved and most beautiful uh, daughter. Uh, so to rid himself of this unwelcome and in his mind unworthy suitor, he devises a quest that uh, Baron must fulfill in order to win the hand of Luthien. Uh, what he must do is he must make a journey into the fortress of uh, the dark uh, evil lord Morgoth and fetch from his crown one of the three uh, beautiful jewels of the world, which are called Silmarils, which shine with the light of a star. Uh, what we know about this, uh, this crown and these jewels on the, the uh, crown of Morgoth is uh, that he... Uh, stole these from the undying lands, uh, and though they caused him exceeding pain and turned his, burned his hands black, uh, he insisted on putting them upon his crown, even though he suffers unbearable agony and anguish uh, uh, by the presence of the beautiful light of these Silmarils, uh, which is, uh, as an aside, just a remarkable insight about the nature of evil, that it wants to, it can only cling to the good things that have been created by God, uh, 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 and in clinging to those, it uh, endures extraordinary pain, uh, but that's its only alternative because it can create nothing of its own. Uh, in any case, uh, the difficulty is that these Silmarils are not only upon the crown of the most powerful being in the world, the Dark Lord Morgoth, but they're uh, hidden deep in the recesses of his castle of Angband. Uh, moreover, this castle is guarded by uh, myriads of dark creatures like Balrogs, which are uh, creatures of flame uh, uh, bearing a whip. Uh, uh, Werewolves and every imaginable creature lie between Baron, the mortal man, and the object of his quest that he must fetch in order to win the hand of Luthien. So, however, Thingol will only accede to Baron's request uh, if he brings him such a Silmaril from uh, the crown of Morgoth. Well aware that the king intends the challenge of a sentence of death, Baron nevertheless laughs and off he goes on his quest. He says before he goes, for a little price do elven kings sell their daughters for gems and things made by craft. But if this be your will, O Thingle, I will perform it. And when we meet again, my hand shall hold the Silmaril for the iron, from the iron crown. Uh, off he goes on this quest, uh, and it's a long uh, story of light and darkness and human love, which uh, I will summarize now. <laughs> on his way to recover the holy jewel, uh, Baron is soon cast into a pit to be devoured by werewolves. Uh, he is in a, a tight spot in the very pit of despair, but Luthien, uh, his beloved, uh, has followed after him. And as another aside, uh, this story runs entirely counter to uh, the stories of feminine passivity. Uh, there's actually very little of that in Tolkien, by the way. Uh, in any case, uh, she rescues him from the pit and the werewolves with the aid of her ancestral magic and with the friendship of Huan, the hound of uh, the gods. Uh, and they eventually achieve their quest together. It is she who captivates Morgoth by uh, uh, the beauty of a song. She lulls him into a sleep. Uh, this should sound familiar if you're familiar with Greek mythology. Uh, as he is lulled to sleep, uh, Baron cuts loose the Silmaril from his crown, and he now has the object of his quest in hand. However, as they are on their way out of uh, the castle, uh, they encounter a fearsome, monstrous wolf by the name of Karkaroth, uh, which means Red Maw. Uh, his other name is An Anfoglir, not sure that's how that's pronounced, which means Jaws of Thirst. 
Thinking the light of the Silmaril will daunt the beast, uh, Baron holds the shining gem up to the beast, who, far from daunted, uh, bites his hand off with the Silmaril in it. And again, of course, uh, the, the darkness of evil cannot stand the light in. Uh, the light of the Silmaril begins to burn right through the guts of the beast. Uh, f running now for their lives, uh, Thingol, uh, excuse me, uh, Baron now maimed and Luthien return to uh, Thingol. Uh, and uh, when Thingol sees Baron, he says, well, what of the quest? Uh, you can only have the hand of my daughter if you have in your hand uh, the gem of the Silmaril. And so at this moment uh, that Baron uh, pulls out now his stump of, the ha of a hand and says, uh, even now the Silmaril is in my hand. Uh, with such an audacious reply such as this, Thingol reluctantly agrees to allow the two to marry. Uh, their happiness, however, is soon to be uh, interrupted because the very beast, uh, the great wolf, the red maw, uh, who swallowed the Silmaril, has now attacked the kingdom. Uh, and in fighting off the beast, uh, in fighting off this great wolf, uh, Baron is mortally wounded and thus begins his journey deep into the underworld to go the way that all mortal men will go. Uh, Luthien... Uh, ever uh, uh, ready to uh, uh, cast off any stereotypes of passive womanhood, uh, descends into the underworld uh, after her beloved. And she finds herself uh, face to face with the Lord of Death himself. And she appeals on the basis of the great heroism of Baron and then the greatness of their love uh, to the Lord of the world himself, uh, that she would grant, that he would grant uh, her beloved um, um, more life uh, uh, as a mortal. Uh, and the Lord of the world agrees to this, uh, provided uh, Luthien herself sacrifices her own native immortality as an elf and embraces the life of a mortal woman. Uh, to which she agrees, and the two return from the underworld, uh, and they live a brief lifespan uh, in which their greatest accomplishment is they uh, uh, bear a child uh, whose name is Dior the Beautiful, who will, event from that line, eventually will come a number of greats, including uh, Elrond, who appears in Lord of the Rings, uh, and Aragorn, the great king uh, of all of Middle-earth. Eventually, however, the, the pair, uh, they, the couple, they, they both die, uh, and they go uh, together into the great mystery of death where there is a hope, but only a small hope, uh, and an uncertain hope uh, with very little information to perhaps the immortality that is stored up for all of the children of the creator, Iluvatar. And thus, uh, the story ends. Uh, Really a remarkable uh, story, uh, a beautiful story. Um, we could perhaps just leave it at that and allow the power of the story to linger on, but uh, that's not why you're here. Uh, let me just draw a few elements here uh, from this story that I think are words of wisdom uh, that are needed in an age such as ours where uh, everything in the minds of people is a power struggle. So. Uh, more wisdom uh, from Middle Earth. Oh. Okay, there we go. First, uh, the power of grace begins when human effort comes to an end. So as I read this story, there are lots of ways to read this story, but I think Luthien is perhaps uh, a pure symbol of divine grace. Uh, and how remarkable that... Uh, <coughs> Uh, that, you know, Tolkien, who has lots of Christ figures throughout, uh, finds his way in this story to see the, the bearer of the redemptive story, uh, the great sacrificial figure, as a woman in this uh, figure. So again, uh, uh, Tolkien sort of, uh, sort of explodes all the categories. I mean, people will still call him a, a chauvinist. They must not have read this story. Uh, but here's what I mean. The power of grace begins when human effort comes to an end. 
Uh, there is much about Baron, this great mortal man, to commend him. I mean, he's noble, uh, he's brave, uh, he laughs in the face of death. Uh, he's a great warrior. Um, he is dauntless, uh, courageous as he makes a journey into uh, uh, the heart of all evil, uh, which uh, a lesser man uh, would fear to even approach. Uh, there he goes, off into the, the evil lair. Uh, however, in this story, he very quickly comes to a dead end. He finds himself in a pit of despair uh, to be ravaged by werewolves. And it's precisely at that lowest point where he cannot save himself, even though he is supposed to be the hero of this story, uh, that he comes to a dead end and just then the light of grace comes in the form of his beloved Luthien to rescue him from the pit. Uh, there's a, very, there's a very deep truth there. I mean, and we got into some of that last week. I mean, uh, remember Frodo, who at the very end of his quest as he's supposed to cast the ring of evil into uh, the fiery pit, he finds that he cannot. And it's only from a, a, a place where he has not been expecting it. Leaping out of the shadows is Gollum, who bites the ring off his finger, dancing in joy, uh, finds himself cast into the pit. Uh, it seems as if Tolkien is very interested in telling stories of heroes who come to the end of themselves and cannot, without further help, without divine aid, complete their quest. That's, that's, that's the human condition, isn't it? We make great promises, uh, but ultimately we will all come to a point in which uh, human effort is insufficient to complete the task. Uh, and then, you know, perhaps erupting from places we don't expect or leaping out of the shadows uh, where we least expected it comes divine aid uh, where human effort has come to the end of its rope. Remarkable. Isn't that the kind of story people need to hear? Okay, second. Wow, I really botched that. Okay. Well, pretend like you don't see the third one there. <laughs> Second is, love can fully embrace us only when all grasping ceases. I just love this. I mean, this is so artfully constructed. Uh, I mean, I, I hate to even mention it. It's, uh, it's like explaining the punchline of a joke. Uh, but just consider this. Uh, Baron can only have the hand of his beloved in marriage when he loses his grasping right hand. Astonishing. Uh, and, and that's the nature of it. Uh, so long as we are grasping after what we desire, uh, we cannot have what we truly desire because you can't have the beloved uh, in uh, the grasp of an iron fist. Uh, there are many things that you can grasp and uh, keep for yourself, uh, but the deeper uh, realities, uh, the higher gifts uh, that are given to us by God, uh, cannot be had in a grasp. It can only be had when uh, we lose our ability to grasp and we're simply embraced. Uh, so long as he was grasping the Silmaril, and you know, some of the background of the Silmarillion is uh, these, these uh, jewels which capture the, the light of a star uh, do nothing but cause wars as people lust after the jewels and fight with one another to grasp them. Uh, I mean, the best thing would be to let, the, let evil grasp them and we instead are embraced by higher goods that cannot be contained uh, in, uh, you know, some limited form like a gem. Can you really contain the light of a star? Of course not. Uh, and the Silmarils, in some sense, uh, 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 they embody uh, trying to contain what cannot be contained in a limited form. Uh, to grasp what ultimately cannot be grasped. I mean, if, if you've ever been in a relationship that means something, you know that so long as you are grasping, you cannot have. And you can have only when you cease to grasp. It's only when Baron loses his grasping right hand that he can, he can have the hand of his beloved in marriage. Third, the most divine of all actions is to sacrifice. And here is where Tolkien, who, you know, in, in all of his writings, uh, it, you, uh, there is almost no sense of uh, the Christian story in any explicit way. 
I mean, yes, there are Christ figures. Yes, you know, Gandalf who gives his life to save uh, the others and then returns again in a new form, you know, resurrected. Of course, that echoes the Christ story. But he, you know, Tolkien never mentions uh, anything that is explicitly Christian. Uh, why is that? Because he wants to tell the truth, but, you know, tell it slant. Uh, but here he comes very close. Uh, uh, just consider this, Luthien, who has the gift of immortality, in order to fetch her beloved from the ravages of the grave, lays down her immortality uh, so that the two can be uh, embraced one by the other uh, in uh, love, in marriage. Uh, she lays down her immortality and embraces a mortal life. You know, she, in other words, lays down one nature, the elven nature, uh, and in order to embrace a human nature precisely that she, so that she can have her beloved. Uh, what is it that Paul says, Philippians 2? Uh, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not consider equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking on the form of a slave and being found in human likeness, became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him, giving him the name that is above every name, so that the name of, at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow and every tongue confess to the glory of God the Father. You know, the laying down of uh, divine prerogative, uh, the laying down of life so that uh, the beloved could be rescued from the ravages of death, uh, that, that is a divine story. In fact, it's the divinest of all stories uh, because it, it's the most divine of all actions to sacrifice one's life for another. And, you know, somewhat hidden in this story is the far-off hope that these two who enter into, at the end of their mortal lives, uh, enter into the darkness of death will find it a, 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 a dark, low portal, a door, uh, into the uh, ever-lit, bright realms of eternity. Uh, which is the, the hope that kind of lingers over all of the stories that Tolkien tells, uh, whether it's in The Hobbit or The Lord of the Rings or The Silmarillion. Uh, it's all this sort of uncertain hope, but a very real hope that beyond death, if we could just stop grasping after life, you know, like Sauron or Morgoth or anyone who's trying to hold on to uh, the, the, the finite light of a Silmaril, that if they could just stop grasping after mortal life, uh, they would be given a far greater gift, which is not finite light, but infinite light. And not a finite lifespan, but an infinite one in the presence of the creator who is the hidden presence in every story that Tolkien tells. What a beautiful story, but the only way to get there is to stop grasping and to make a gift of self in a sacrificial death. That's the only way. Uh, and that, among other things, is what we learn from this story of Baron and Luthien. Um, there are a couple ways that you could read this story if you're interested. One, you could get a copy of the Silmarillion, and there's a chapter on Baron and Luthien. It's a really long chapter, but it's well worth reading. There's also an independent volume uh, 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 that's called Baron and Luthien that you can get, um, and you can read this story at greater length. It's truly a, a work of art. Uh, what then do we make of the idea that... Um, what everybody's after is just power. You know, everything's a, a power play, uh, despite the rhetoric uh, uh, that we uh, give to the contrary. Um, if somebody wants to believe that, I don't think there is any argument that we can make that could perhaps, that could really cause them to uh, cease to hold that position. I, I think that at least, uh, you know, there are very few people that could be persuaded by an argument to the contrary. Uh, but there have been many people who have been persuaded by the power of a story to the contrary, contrary and find this, the, the beauty of self-sacrificial love, such as we find in the story of Baron and Luthien, to, be all, to have all of the evidential power that they could possibly want uh, and to persuade their heart prior to persuading their mind. And that's why, yet again, like Tolkien, we ought to find ways to tell the truth, uh, but tell it slant. You know, the play's the thing. 
wherein I'll catch the conscience of the king. Uh, second story. Uh, the uh, Narnia, it's like three or four, whatever, it doesn't matter. Four, it's four. Um, uh, the Voyage of the Dawn Treader. So I'm going to set this up a little bit. I'm going to read a section uh, that we're going to look at. Uh, and in particular, what I want us to reflect upon is uh, this uh, cynical assumption that people can't change. Uh, people can change. Uh, as it turns out, it's just really, really painful to do so, which is why very few people want to do it. Uh, in this story, um, a, a few of the Pevensey children who have been on previous adventures in uh, the magical land of Narnia um, and uh, another uh, young man who is their cousin whose name is Eustace Clarence Scrub, who as C.S. Lewis comments, uh, with, he almost deserved a name like that. <laughs> Uh, one day in, uh, the, in Eustace's house, uh, uh, Eustace and uh, a couple of the Pevensey children are looking at a picture on the wall that depicts a ship that looks something like this, a, a shape of a dragon. And uh, two of the Pen Pevensey children uh, r remark that this, this looks like uh, a Narnian ship if they've ever seen one. Uh, and Eustace, of course, pokes fun at that because uh, he is uh, the most unlikable of all children. Uh, he's, he's greedy, uh, he's critical, he's sarcastic. Uh, 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 he never misses an opportunity to criticize other people to make himself look good. Uh, he never misses an opportunity to grasp the good things around so that he can have more than other people. He's just in every way a despicable human being uh, that nobody wants to be around. Uh, he begins poking fun at their very notion of Narnia because he's overheard them talking about this magical land and says, hey, you're too old for uh, this kind of make-believe story. And it's at that moment that uh, the whole room begins to rock and to sway. Uh, and uh, they look at the picture and it looks as if the waves are actually moving. And before they know it, what it was, a picture on the wall becomes a portal into another world. And they find, find themselves uh, swimming for dear life uh, in an ocean. And they see a real ship, uh, just like the one in the picture, uh, not too far off in the distance. Uh, the sailors of the ship pull them aboard, and it turns out it is a Narnian ship. Uh, they've been transported to the magical world. Uh, this ship is uh, on a quest led by Prince Caspian, the prin uh, King Caspian, the king of Narnia, to find the nine lost lords of Narnia. Uh, and off they are, sailing off uh, to the farthest reaches of the west. Uh, Eustace, however, uh, quickly complains about how cold he is and about how small the boat is and how uh, even a motorboat in England uh, would put this one to shame, uh, making himself generally odious to everybody on board. Uh, and so it continues. Uh, Eustace finds himself in trouble at numerous points when they're rationing water. He sneaks uh, and uh, steals water for himself, uh, gets, getting himself through his just terrible attitude uh, and unlovable personality into all kinds of trouble and alienating himself from everybody else on board. Uh, eventually, after a few adventures along the way, uh, the, the Dawn Treader um, uh, anchors off the coast of an uninhabited island uh, where uh, they stop uh, to set up camp and make repairs on the ship, which requires a lot of work which means Eustace uh, uh, wanders off to where he won't be seen anybody and so he won't have to pitch uh, in and, and help with any of the work that's going on. And as he's wandering off away from camp, uh, he wanders into uh, a, a cave. Uh, and he sees there a, a, a dragon uh, and a dragon's lair. And right as he sort of uh, stumbles across the dragon's horde, he sees uh, the dragon. Uh, and uh, he has no idea what it is because he's never read any of the right books. And so he has no idea what a dragon is. Uh, but he knows this is a beast that he does not want to mess with. And uh, he sees, you know, the fire breathing dragon and the smoke and all of that. But uh, the dragon, as it turns out, is at the very end of its life. Uh, it gives one last puff of smoke and then teeters over and keels over and dies. Uh, 
Meanwhile, uh, Eustace uses this as an opportunity to go through the dragon's hoard, and he finds uh, an arm ring made of gold and silver, uh, and he places the arm ring on his arm, and he falls asleep. When he awakes, uh, his arm is uh, in excruciating pain, and he wanders off uh, and he thinks the dragon has returned because wherever he goes, he hears the footsteps of the dragon. And every time he whimpers in fear, the dragon growls until eventually he finds his way to uh, a pool of water and he looks down into the pool of water and he sees a dragon staring out at him uh, as his reflection. Uh, what has happened to poor Eustace? Uh, whatever he has been on the out inside, uh, he, had na he is now on the outside. He's become a dragon. Uh, lamenting this great turn of affairs, he does uh, find a number of things that are enjoyable. He can fly and he's extraordinarily strong. And so he makes his way back to the camp uh, and he reveals himself and they see it's a dragon. And they, they come up closer uh, because they're going to have, you know, they're all, you know, noble warriors. So they're going to slay the dragon and they notice that the dragon's crying. And they, they somehow put together that Eustace, who they've been looking for and has disappeared, has returned in the form of a dragon. And neither he nor they know how to transform him back. Uh, it's coming to the point where the journey must continue and they conclude uh, that really there's no way to go on a long quest uh, to faraway lands with a dragon in tow. Uh, for one thing, uh, they have no way to feed a dragon. Um, for another thing, the dragon won't even fit in the boat uh, and couldn't be expected to fly all the way to the destination of their great quest. Uh, and Eustace, they don't want to tell Eustace this, but Eustace kind of puts two and two together. And so uh, in a kind of honorably sacrificial move, uh, he decides to wander off into the wilderness so that they can uh, be spared the pain of sailing off without him. So off he goes into the wilderness and he sees uh, a lion. Uh, and that's where I pick up uh, the story of Eustace's transformation. Uh, Eustace is explaining this story uh, after the fact. Um, uh, and so it's told in first person. He said, well, anyway, I looked up and I saw the very last thing that I expected. A huge lion coming slowly towards me. And one strange thing was that there was no moon last night, but there was moonlight where the lion was. So it came nearer and nearer. I was terribly afraid of it. You might think that being a dragon, I could have knocked any lion out easily enough, but it wasn't that kind of fear. I wasn't afraid of it eating me. I was afraid of it, if you can understand. Well, it came close up to me and looked straight into my eyes, and I shut my eyes tight, but that wasn't any good because it told me to follow it. You mean it spoke? said Edmund. Oh, I don't know, now that you mention it. I don't think it did, but it told me all the same. I knew I'd have to do what it told me. So I got up and followed it, and it led me a long way into the mountains. And there was always this moonlight over and around the lion wherever he went. So at last we came to the top of a mountain I'd never seen before. In the top of this mountain there was a garden, trees and fruit and everything. In the middle of it there was a well. I knew it was a well because you could see the water bubbling up from the bottom of it, but it was a lot bigger than most wells, like a very big round bath with marble steps going down into it. The water was as clear as anything, and I thought, if I could get in there and bathe, it would ease the pain in my leg. Remember, he has the arm ring around his uh, fore uh, leg. But the lion told me I must undress first. Mind you, I don't know if he said any words out loud or not. I was just going to say that I couldn't undress because I hadn't any clothes on when I suddenly thought that dragons are snaky sorts of things, and snakes can cast their skins. Oh, of course, thought I. That's what the lion means. So I started scratching myself, and my scales began coming off all over the place. Then I scratched a little deeper, and instead of just scales coming off here and there, my whole skin started peeling off beautifully, like it does after an illness or if I was a banana. 
In a minute or two, I just stepped out of it. I could see it lying there beside me, looking rather nasty, and it was a most lovely feeling. So I started to go down into the well for my bath. But just as I was going to put my feet into the water, I looked down and saw that they were all hard and rough and wrinkled and scaly, just as they had been before. Oh, that's all right, said I. It only means I had another smaller suit on underneath the first one. I'll have to get out of it, too. So I scratched and tore again, and this underskin peeled off beautifully, and I stepped out and left it lying beside the other one and went down into the well for my bath. Well, exactly the same thing happened again, and I thought to myself, oh dear, however many skins have I got to take off? For I was longing to bathe my leg. So I scratched away for the third time and got off a third skin, just like two of the others, and stepped out of it. But as soon as I looked at myself in the water, I knew it had been no good. I resemble this story quite a bit. I've shed a few skins myself. Then the lion said, but I don't know if it spoke, you will have to let me undress you. I was afraid of his claws, I can tell you, but I was pretty nearly desperate now. So I just lay flat on my back and let him do it. The very first tear he made was so deep that I had thought it had gone right into my heart. When he began pulling the skin off, it hurt worse than anything I've ever felt. The only thing that made me able to bear it was just the pleasure of feeling the stuff peel off. You know, if you've ever picked a scab off a sore place, it hurts like Billy O, but it is fun to see it coming away. <laughs> I know exactly what you mean, said Edmund. Well, goes goes on Eustace. He peeled the beastly stuff right off, just as I thought I'd done it myself the other three times, only they hadn't hurt. And there it was, lying on the grass, only ever so much thicker and darker and more knobbly looking than the others had been. And there was I, as smooth and soft as a peeled switch, and smaller than I had ever been. Then he caught hold of me. I didn't like that much, for I was very under a tender underneath, now that I'd no skin on, and he threw me into the water. It smarted like anything, but only for a moment. After that, it became perfectly delicious, and as soon as I started swimming and splashing, I found that all the pain had gone from my arm, and then I saw why I turned into a boy again. You'd think me simply phony if I told you how I felt about my own arms. I know they've no muscle and are pretty moldy compared with Caspian's, but I was glad to see them. After a bit, the lion took me out and dressed me. Dressed you? said Edmund, with his paws? Well, I don't exactly remember that bit, but he did somehow or other in new clothes, the same I've got on now, as a matter of fact, and then I was suddenly back here, which is what makes me think it must have been a dream. No, it wasn't a dream, said Edmund. Why not? Well, there are the clothes for one thing, and you have been, well, undragoned for another. What do you think it was then, asked Eustace. I think you've seen Aslan, said Edmund. Aslan, said Eustace. Eustace. I've heard that name mentioned several times since we joined the Dawn Treader, and I felt, I don't know what, I hated it. But I was hating everything then. And by the way, I'd like to apologize. I'm afraid I've been pretty beastly. That's all right, said Edmund. Between ourselves, uh, you haven't been as bad as I was on my first trip to Narnia. You were only an ass, but I was a traitor. Well, don't tell me about it then, said Eustace. But who is Aslan? Do you know him? Well, he knows me, said Edmund. He is the great lion the son of the emperor over the sea, who saved me and saved Narnia. We've all seen him. Lucy sees him most often. And it may be Aslan's country we're sailing to. Uh, and that's the story of Eustace's transformation. Uh, he was always a dragon, you have to understand. So that's one thing you must understand about this story. He was just, for most of his life, uh, a dragon on the inside and a boy on the outside. However, when he stumbled across the dragon's lair, which, of course, is the great story of uh, the greedy, hoarding nature of selfish humanity. And that's the, that's the dragon sitting on uh, his pile of gold. When he wanders and finds himself on this, uh, uh, this pile of gold, he himself is turned into a dragon. And, uh, and what he is on the outside matches what he is on the inside. 
Um, and when, of course, he's helpless, uh, it's at precisely that moment uh, that Aslan shows up, who's the only one who can do anything about this. Um, and it's a very moving uh, bit of the story, isn't it? That, that in order to uh, uh, be transformed, he's got to shed uh, the skin of the dragon. Um, and he, he scratches and scratches until one uh, layer of skin is removed and he's gratified for a brief moment, but oh, to his dismay, he, dis he discovers uh, there's, there's more dragon underneath. And so he scratches, scratches again until he removes yet another skin and to his dismay, uh, there's more dragon underneath. I don't know if you relate to that. I mean, just the moment I kick one besetting sin, I discover that there are two more in its place. Uh, he does that a third time until, ah, it's, it's Aslan who must do the work. What do we learn from this uh, story? Wisdom of Narnia. First, uh, people can change. You know, this is transformation. Uh, but transformation is always on the far side of sacrifice. I mean, there's no genuinely good transformation that can't happen if we're not willing to uh, well, what does Jesus say? If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. I mean, the road to transformation, the road to uh, changing for the better, is always, I mean, it always requires shedding uh, those aspects of our identity uh, that are an obstacle to truly being good. Uh, and uh, that parting with who we have been in order to become someone new is always a deeply painful experience. It always is. I mean, that's why very few people do change is because they try and discover how painful it really is. I mean, it's gratifying, isn't it? It's gratifying when for one moment we have some victory, just through sheer willpower, victory over, you know, some uh, besetting sin or what have you. It is gratifying. Uh, but it is disheartening, to say the least, to realize that uh, there is going to be no painless way to shed all that we must shed in order to be people who are truly and genuinely transformed. Uh, but to truly change is really to shed one identity and take on another. Um, and that, that feels like death more than anything else. A dying to self, a painful sacrifice. Uh, but the road to transformation always takes us to the far side of sacrifice. Uh, we also learn something else from this story that we've learned in the previous one. Uh, note this, uh, at precisely the moment that Baron came to the end of himself in that dark pit beset by werewolves, uh, uh, is precisely the moment that uh, divine aid comes to him from the outside. It's when he comes to the end of himself that the power of grace begins. And so we learn that here too. The power of grace begins where human effort comes to the end of itself. Uh, it is Aslan who has claws that can really dig deep, deep uh, that can cut to the quick, that can cut to the very heart itself, that must painfully tear uh, that final layer of dragon skin off of Eustace. Uh, it's painful. Uh, it's like death. And it's only then that he can go down into, I mean, it's sort of obvious, but, you know, if you don't, if you don't know, you don't know, especially young children reading this. Uh, then it's only then, having shed the old identity, they can go down into the baptismal waters and be transformed and therefore walk in newness of life. Uh, it's only as Aslan allow Eustace to take three layers of skin off before he really intervenes. Because he wants, like, uh, like our Lord, uh, he wants to bring Eustace to the end of himself so that he can be truly transformed by a power beyond himself and beyond his ken. Uh, and that's the nature of it. Uh, you know, uh, upon reflection, I, I really do understand why people believe that people don't change. You know, that cynical assumption. Um, it's because, humanly speaking, people don't change. Because people can't change. I mean, what is it that Jesus tells Nicodemus uh, in, under the cloak of darkness? Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you are born again, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. That's it. You've got to be born again. And to be born again, you must first die. Um, 
uh, which means, and can anyone be born? What does uh, Nicodemus respond? How can a man being old be born again? Perfectly rational response. Uh, he is absolutely right that we are, uh, if we deal only in he, uh, the realm of human possibility, I mean, people can change a little bit. You can shed, you know, three layers of skin, perhaps, um, and have the appearance of deep transformation. Uh, but humanly speaking, people do not because they cannot change. Um, and so I really, I, you know, I don't want to get down on people who live with these cynical assumptions. I mean, I think, if anything, the, human, uh, the, the Christian response to people who are trapped in a storyless world, and after all, I mean, there's only one story that you can tell that's worth anything, which is the story of redemption. All stories kind of sort of coalesce in this great story of redemption. Um, it's hard to fault them for the assumptions that they have, because if this is the, st the only stories that they've ever been told is that everybody's after power and people don't change, uh, it's hard to dispute that, because humanly speaking, I think both of those things are 100% true. Uh, but uh, God works on the far side of human possibility. And that's what we see in both of these stories. There, there is the possibility, the impo what does Karl Barth call it? The impossible possibility of divine aid coming from beyond all the whole horizon of human possibility. Approaching at infinite speed, uh, breaking into the realm of human possibility and doing what uh, humanity cannot. That's the greatest story ever told. Uh, and we see a glimpse of that in both of these stories, Baron and Luthien. The, uh, the incursion, the breaking in of uh, a diviner power. And we see that here too, uh, the breaking in of a divine power of grace that can do what humanity cannot. Uh, how does one tell this story? Uh, I don't know. I mean, uh, Tolkien knew more about that than I did, uh, but I think we can learn from him. C.S. Lewis learned, knew more about that than I do, but we can learn from him. Uh, but I think really the Christian mission ultimately boils down to finding ways to tell the old, old story in a way that it can be heard and it alone can, well, just think about it. Um, these two assumptions, what are they if not people finding themselves in the dark pit of barren where there is no possibility of escape? and just passively acceding uh, to uh, fate. Uh, could we perhaps tell a story uh, that could be heard of something breaking in from the outside, a light beyond the, the Silmarils that we clutch after, uh, that is a truly greater light uh, that would speak of things like transformation, uh, sacrifice, a gift that's given without expectation of return. Uh, can we tell a story like that? Well, I, I think the best thing that I can do, and perhaps the best thing that you can do, is uh, hear these stories and tell them as best we can. Uh, and perhaps as we do this, uh, you know, to our young people, uh, uh, as well as old, as we tell these stories, perhaps the truth can find its way in slant, uh, because ultimately, I mean, uh, most people, most people who change and convert, uh, uh, what happens first is that their hearts are converted and their mind follows after. And that's, that's ultimately the power of story. That's why we do this. That's why myths, stories, that's why we spent the last three weeks on these because they have a story beyond uh, mere rational discourse. And so let's be people of stories. Let's tell good stories. Uh, let's enjoy good stories uh, and see what kind of power that unleashes within our communities. Uh, with that, I, I conclude. I thank you for your kind attention. Uh, it's, uh, uh, it, it's gratifying, to say the least, that you'd find your way out of the dark cold of uh, uh, November nights and uh, come and hear me speak. So uh, thank you. You've been nothing but a uh, stunningly good audience, uh, and I bless you as you go on your way. And I'll stick around for a bit if you have any questions. Uh, feel free to come on up. Oh, I'll take a question from the floor. Brenda. Yeah. Um, I've always felt that whenever you come into contact with the glory of God through his son by
coming to a lecture or listening to a sermon or reading the word, you aren't the same person you were five minutes ago. Oh, sure. Yeah. I mean, um, you know, there's something about the light of glory, which is very similar to the light of beauty uh, that uh, transforms us. I mean, I, I think of uh, Moses who, you know, on the mount beheld the light of God's glory and as a result his face shone as he returned to the company of Israel. Uh, and what Paul says is, um, we also uh, shall be transformed from one degree uh, of glory to another as our faces shine with the, the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So, um, I think that's a, a, a brilliant contribution. Thank you. Yeah, Bev. So uh, you just said um, conversion is when the hearts are converted and the minds follow. The minds follow right? Yeah, I think the point I was making there was I think with a lot of people, what, uh, what, where conversion first happens is a conversion of the heart, and often the mind follows. Um, now, there are some people who have an intellectual conversion first, but uh, they're kind of an odd species. Okay, so by mind, you're referring to intellectual. Mm -hmm. okay. Because I just had this conversation with uh, someone by phone before I came here. Uh, we were talking about some issues in our lives, problems in our lives. And my word to her was, um, because she knows a lot about theology, was from if the, the, the faith has to go from the mind to the heart to become trusting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, there was an Archbishop of Canterbury, I can't remember which one, who said the journey from the, the head to the heart uh, is the most arduous and difficult journey known to mankind. It's because you have to surrender. Yeah, I mean, it's because, you know, um, you know, the heart must break, I think, before it can ultimately receive the, uh, the grace of God. So which is it? Mind or heart or heart? <laughs> It depends. <laughs> I mean, I think, I think you know, uh, you know, God's a good fisherman. I mean, he doesn't care if he sets the hook in the lip or swallow it. I mean, either way, he's going to reel us in. <laughs> well, thank you all. You have my gratitude. Uh, bless you as you go on your way. Thank you. This makes you want to